All right, everyone, so we are looking at Alice Walker's Everyday Use, which is um, an amazing short story. Alice Walker is a modern writer. We're moving around in terms of time frame a little bit. Um, she's a modern writer, so this was published in 1973. And Everyday Use essentially is a, a story that discusses two, um, two different worlds. It's, it's illusion versus reality is essentially what it's talking about. And um, it's talking about African-American identity within and of itself. So there's very little discussion of race relations between white and black. It's really more of a discussion of what is it to be African-American in modern day America. Um, and so we have a little bit of a different structure here. We start by this first person narrative and we don't understand who's talking or really what the situation is. And through the narrative and through the monologue, um, we begin to understand the characters and the social situation and what's, what the conflict is. Um, so we start by this woman talking about how her she has a young how they're sweeping up the house and we get we understand that they they live on a, some type of land um, somewhere that's that's probably uh, a farm of some kind and they probably do fine for themselves but they don't have a lot of money they don't have a lot of land they don't have a lot of things um, so this is a very simple life probably in the south somewhere um, and we understand that this woman has a little girl named Maggie who's standing it over and she's kind of um, nervously in the corner awaiting the arrival of this of her sister. So we understand this woman is the mother and little Maggie's waiting for the sister and she's very nervous about seeing her sister. She always gets this way because she doesn't quite measure up to, to the sister in a lot of ways. And it also mentions that Maggie has all these burns on her, her body. Um, and we're going to find out exactly why. So we're going to have a little bit of a sort of a side, an, an aside or a flashback essentially before we get back to the mod, the present day narrative. So. Um, from this point on 921, she goes into a discussion of of what D is. So D is the other daughter, and D is a, a, a great bit older than Maggie. Maggie's very young, um, and so we've discovered that D has left um, home and she's uh, coming back to visit. And D's very, I mean, uh, Maggie's very, very nervous about this. And the mother kind of goes into this discussion of what happens when Dee comes home. And she has this image where she imagines, it's like on TV, where the, the child who's made it, as she says, comes home and the parents are so warm and loving and happy and welcoming and, and the youngest child is just there, just feeling a little bit out of place. And she imagines that it would be something like that, but it's not reality. That's not reality, this is. This is. And so we have, again, this discussion of reality versus illusion. Um, and she brings up these sort of modern references to kind of point out that modern consumer culture is not reality necessarily. Um, it's a culture of things, of stuff that's not real, it's not used, it's not useful. And that's the kind of life that she lives, is the useful life. So she compares um, things like the Polaroid camera and the, and the dimension of Johnny Carson um, these, these, you know, TV and radio and all these different things to her life. And she says in the bottom, I'm in real life, I'm a large big bone woman with a rough man working hands. And so she goes into the discussion of how her life in reality is nothing like what you see on TV. It's, it's hard work. And we start to understand that she's a single mom, um, who's raised two kids on her own. She runs the farm and she does everything. Um, she talks about one winter, I knocked a bull calf straight in the brain. Um, so she, she's not afraid to slaughter animals to feed her family. So she does what is necessary for her family, and she's proud to do it. Um, and so we have this interesting discussion of gender also unfolded in here and how gender roles, traditional gender roles, are starting to be um, blurred at this point. And this is 1973, so this is post-first wave feminism, post-civil um, rights. And we really have an understanding for the first time that this is a modern sentiment that we often believe and we know that women can do exactly what a man can do and what a lot of women raise their own families and provide for their families. But in 1973, this was not a common phenomenon. So we have a really unique character, but the way she describes it is not something that is exclamatory or boastful. It's this is this is reality and it's what's necessary. Ergo, I'm going to live this reality. So um, she has a very brief moment on 922 where she brings in the idea of race relations. And she says that who can even, she talks things about Johnny Carson, talking to Johnny Carson, just imagining it. And she says, but who can even imagine me looking at a strange white man in the eye? So again, even though this is, you know, the end of civil, of civil rights, um, 1970s, we have uh, still um, um, lingering effects of, of segregation that she's kind of talking about, especially in the poor South. Um, 
so Maggie kind of brings it back to the present and she says, you know, how do I look, Mama? She tells her to come out. And she starts thinking about Maggie versus Dee. Um, and she goes back to this idea of what happened in the fire. And this is where we see the difference between the two. So Dee, um, something happened that set their old house on fire, burnt it to the ground. Maggie was maimed and hurt in this fire. Dee escaped unharmed. When they got out into the yard during the fire, she says she looked at Dee and she saw her standing by this tree and she almost had this, this look of, of just, just hatred in her eyes and vengeance. And she's watching the house burn to the ground almost with like this, this, this pleasure. And she gets this idea, I mean, it's a suggested idea that maybe Dee had something to do with this fire. She hates the house. She hates her roots. She hates what she is. And that's where we start to understand what Dee becomes. So she goes into the discussion about how Dee always wanted nice things. Dee was educated. Dee got to go to college. Dee learned to read. Um, she would read to her mom and to Maggie. Um, and she was always about appearance and style and what is on the outside as far as who she was versus what is on the inside. And that's again, comes back to the idea of illusion versus reality. Dee does not live in reality necessarily. She tried to escape her reality by becoming an illusion of something else. Um, and then, she, so on the bottom of 922, she takes this idea of education and releases it to herself, the mother does. And she says, I never had an education. If you'll notice, the mom does not ever have a name in this story. Um, she doesn't get an identity in the same way that Dee or Maggie does, but she's a central figure, and it's really important that she she kind of speaks her sort of understanding of truth um, through this sort of nameless identity. And she says, I never got an education, and she goes, don't ask me why. Um, we ask user questions, and they do now in 1927. So she says, things are changing. I know things have progressed, um, but that doesn't change where I came from. This is how I was raised. This is what I know. Um, and so there's a sort of uh, an appreciation of where she's come from in the past and the struggle she's been through. And she says, never could care to you. And I was always better at a man's job. And so she, again, brings up this idea of gender. She says, I can do exactly what they did. I used to love to milk all the time, um, the cows. And, and so we have this everyday sort of grounded understanding of this woman is just salt of the earth kind of woman. Um, and, and gender roles here are very fluid. And so she says, um, she and Maggie again are waiting for Dee and they think about the fact that she never really even had many friends. Dee always had her friends because they were always enamored with her or um, in awe of her or intimidated by her. And that's sort of the life that Dee has lived. And that brings us back to the present, which is Dee. So Dee comes and she steps out of the car. And the first thing we see is everything about her is, is made of um, sort of a false sense of self. She steps out in her, nothing makes sense. Her dress is down to the ground, even though it's, you know, 100 degrees in, in the South. Um, she's wearing these huge gold, you know, jewelry, and her hair is done very fancy, and it just doesn't fit with the setting of what she's come back to. So Dee is no longer herself, essentially. She's kind of lost herself, and we're going to see that more and more. And as she comes out, she says sort of these, um, these phrases and the mom is, is like what are you saying and um she says Was, uh, so we have this um sort of native african language that she's sort of adopted and and you see everything about her has kind of changed and she's with this man we don't know if the man is um her husband if, if he's if he's a lover what what he is and the mom doesn't know either she doesn't ask um and so she says that her name now is no longer D. It's uh, Asala Malakim, which is what she says is her her given name because um, on 924 she says she doesn't want the name of the people who oppress me, the name given by the people who oppress me. And so the mom has this really interesting exchange with her back and forth. And she says, you know you were named after your aunt uh, uh, D.C. And she says, well, who was she named for? Well, her grandma D. Well, who was she named for? Well, her grandma D. She says, well, how, you know, how far back can you take it? She says, well, beyond that, I can't go past the Civil War. She says, well, there you go. Um, so she's, she's trying to, trying to say that she's escaping her, her, you know, white oppressed roots by returning to her African roots. Um, but the mother can't really understand this. She respects it. She says, sure, I'll call you this name. Tell me it again. Um, but she kind of doesn't understand it because she says, I am who I am. I come from my grandmother and your grandmother and your grandmother, and that's our history. Um, and she, she's kind of proud of her history, of what she's overcome. And Dee is really dismissing 
the struggles and the triumphs of her ancestors in, in saying, oh, no, none of that counts. Um, I'm going back to my African roots. And the mother's saying, but that's not your roots. Your roots are who came before you, who helped make you, who helped make your life. Um, me, Maggie, all these people. So we have this conflict set up between, again, identity and sort of illusion. And we go back and forth between her and um, her her lover or husband, whatever he might be, a Hakima barber. Um, and so they bring in these... It's, a, it's akin to what I would call, say, a lot of hipster discussion today where he says, you know, that he, um, he met the people who were down the road, the cattle feeders, and he says that um, I accept some of their doctrines, but farming and raising cattle is not my style. And um, she, the, the mother just kind of shakes her head as in you accept their doctrines. They're just farmers. They're doing their job. They're raising their cattle. It's, it's, they're doing it to feed their family. So we have kind of her shaking her head as an audience. We're kind of shaking her head going, what are you talking about? Um, they're just normal people. But they've kind of got this pseudo-intellectual um, attitude that they've adopted. And you see this a lot in the beat poets and a lot of things. And, I, and I, it makes sense that she's sort of mocking this a little bit through these characters. Um, so they go in to eat. And as they're eating, Dee sees all of the things that, that she's grown up with, the butter dish and the churn and the butter churner and all these different things. And she starts saying, oh, isn't it just precious and adorable? And I want this and I want this and I want this. And she she forgets that a lot of these things were, were things that were made from her roots. So the butter dish, she says, was made, the mother notes, was made from a tree that was in the house um, that Dee and her first husband, a, a, a ordinary guy um, named Stash used to own and she kind of just brushes it off when Maggie mentions that she doesn't even acknowledge that she was married before to this normal everyday guy um, and so she says you know I want this it's so charming and I want this it's so adorable and the mom's looking at it going yeah it's a beautiful piece but it's you know it's got these nicks in it it's got these cuts from all this use that we've given it it's just a butter dish um, so you see that Adi is starting to appropriate these objects and trying to make them into something that they're not. She's trying to give them the illusion of being something vintage or something, um, you know, artistic and rustic. And really, they're just things that she used, that the mother and Maggie use every single day, things Di used every single day. Um, so after dinner, they go in and they, they bring out these quilts. And this is where things get really intense. And this is sort of the, the climax of the piece. Um, the quilts come out and and they're looking at them and Dee puts them up and she hangs two quilts up and she says, oh, these were Grandma Dee's. And she says, can you even imagine, um, you know, you see the, the, the bits of dress that she put in there and she keeps using this word, imagine, imagine, and like, like she can't quite believe how rustic and, and quaint they are. And it's really a demeaning language that she keeps using when she's talking about this because the mom's looking at it and she's seeing images of herself and her childhood and Maggie's childhood. And she realizes that grandma, her grandma was the one that taught them to sew. Um, and she brings up this idea that um, the grandmother, or that she offered to teach Dee or to give Dee one of these quilts before she left for college. And Dee dismissed it and said they were out of style and out of fashion and she didn't want them. And now she's sort of reappropriating them and saying, oh, these, these are, will be wonderfully um, vintage and rustic artistic pieces. And so the mom asks, well, what are you going to do with them? And she says, or she brings up Maggie. You see, Maggie um, is in the kitchen. She hears, and Dee says, can I have these? And we hear this crash. And the mom realizes that they were promised to Maggie when she's going to marry um, this this young man who's, again, just a nice, normal, everyday guy. Um, and Dee won't, won't stop. She keeps saying, oh, they're so priceless and they're so beautiful and I want them. And the mom finally has to put a stop to it. And Maggie comes to the door and she says very quietly, it's okay, mama, she can have them. Maggie is selflessly trying to give her sister something that she thinks she desires. And that's the, the line in the sand. That's what stops her from, from accepting Dee's behavior. She realizes Dee is no better than either of them. And Dee asks, well, what is Maggie going to do with them? She's just going to use them. And she says, why on earth would she do that? And the mother says, what are you going to do with them? And she says, I'm going to hang them, of course. And it's this, this the irony of that statement um, where Dee thinks this is the most logical use for quilt. Um, that sets the mom off and she walks over and she grabs the quilts and she hugs Maggie to her and she basically tells Dee to leave and get out. 
Um, and so this moment of strength kind of comes in against this forced illusion that Dee has put forth as her identity. Um, and the mom, you know, sort of promotes this idea of, of reality being better than illusion. The reality of their everyday use, their average everyday life with, you know, this, these, this nice young man that Maggie's going to marry is so much better than this false illusion that Dee has come to accept as her identity, which is not real. Um, so she says, you know, that her heritage is not what D said. What D says it is. Her heritage is where she comes from. It's it's her American identity of her ancestors, um, all the strife, all the struggle, but also all the triumphs that they've endured um, since Civil War and on. So I hope you guys liked everyday use. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, move on to the next assignment.